Well, hello everyone. Last time we looked uh, at the split of the Roman Empire into Western and Eastern Empire in the beginning of the 4th century and we saw what um, happened uh, to the Eastern Empire. So the fate of the Eastern Empire which will ultimately be called the Byzantine Empire. Today we start our journey with the western part of the empire and this journey will take us through the whole semester. The um, very early Middle Ages uh, often today are also called the late empire because the Middle Ages will deal with um, Christianity and uh, well uh, partially with Islam as well. Islam has not yet been born, but as we saw, it very much interfered in the fate of uh, Eastern Roman Empire and it will as well interfere in the fate of the Western Roman Empire. But for the most part, we'll be dealing with Christianity and uh, with religion uh, as the um, main point of belief it will dominate all aspects of human existence and uh, human life, human thought and human art will all be very much subordinated to revelation as opposed to reason. The um, early Christians uh, were in fact confused by the Romans with the Jews because uh, while well, they were originally a Jewish sect and Jesus himself did not mean for his teaching to spread anywhere beyond the Jewish community. It was the work of St. Paul, ultimately, who took uh, his interpretation of Jesus' teaching and uh, spread it beyond Palestine. However, meanwhile, tradition tells us that uh, other apostles of Jesus also went uh, around the Mediterranean preaching his message and the uh, early Christianity was not accepted by the Romans as um, a legalized religion because uh, even though Romans were extremely tolerant of all religions they still demanded allegiance to their Roman Empire which uh, the Christians refused to give and as a result, uh, the Roman attitude was, uh, why should we tolerate intolerance? Um, as such, Christianity had to hide. And, uh, and of course, it did not have and did not need any, uh, any buildings, any buildings where they would meet the uh, Christ himself preached from hilltops, as we know. And uh, so did his disciples, either from hilltops or in private homes or, as is in the case with this painting here, uh, from the catacombs. Uh, tradition again has it that Peter did go to Rome and that he was head of the Jewish community in Rome. There was an extensive Jewish community in Rome and that he did preach from the catacombs. And here is a painting by uh, Jan Sticker uh, a painter who lived in the 19th century of showing what it may have, may have looked like. Now, the catacombs um, still today form, uh, as it says here, a warren of tunnels and caves under the city of Rome. They were carved um, in the early stages, uh, sometime between the 5th and the 2nd century BC, and they were carved by uh, escaped criminals, escaped slaves, uh, those who wished to hide, uh, and they hid in the catacombs. Uh, later on, uh, the Jews uh, who formed a large community in Rome needed places for burial and used these catacombs for their own burials and then extended them accordingly and then can they continue to be used uh, by the Christians, uh, who of course were also in hiding. And um, so the network of towns and pa passageway dug into the soft volcanic rock beneath uh, Rome were created, as I said, at a relatively early date. 
they, as, as one can imagine, were dark, damp, uh, riddled with vermin, extremely small, not very convenient um, places. Nevertheless, they came into great use. One can descend into catacombs today and see uh, the uh, likes of this. The um, Christians did not cremate their bodies because they very much believed in the resurrection of the body, in uh, the resurrection of the flesh, in fact, that the bones will acquire flesh at the resurrection, if one is righteous, of course. And as such, the bones had to be preserved, the body had to be preserved. And as you see these niches right there, this is where the coffins were deposited with the bones. And in many of these catacombs, one can see skulls and um, skeletons. They did attempt to decorate these spaces with columns that one would obtain from the outside, and uh, some sort of decoration was attempted. Here is another example. You can see these niches where the boxes, uh, where the coffins were placed. Um, here's another painting by another uh, artist uh, imagining a procession in the catacomb of um, one of the early bishops of Rome, who will later be called Pope, by the name of Calixtus in this case. And this is, he was a bishop of Rome from the early um, third century till um, 223, right here. And uh, they would build makeshift altars there and conduct their ceremonies, all in the catacombs. So catacombs are of great historical importance, well, uh, as well as artistic importance to us, of course. This is uh, a, cat a catacomb of uh, St. Peter and Marcellinus. Um, the saints that we hear about, the early saints, were also buried there. In fact, um, both St. Peter and St. Paul, after being martyred, were buried there and uh, the um, bones of St. Peter presumably were then transferred to the Vatican Hill where they are still interred again, presumably. So for the first 300 years it was an underground religion. Here in fact you can see the skulls. But in these catacombs they did attempt uh, illustration of their art. Now, we must remember that, of course, the Christians did not have any tradition of art. Therefore, whatever they did, they looked back at the, um, at the tradition of, um, of the Romans, at the tradition of the Greeks, at the classical tradition. Yet those among them who attempted to do these paintings were not skilled painters, so they could only imitate what they had seen. And uh, in this case, this is a ceiling done in fresco, and in the middle of the ceiling is um, uh, Christ the Shepherd, here in fact, Christ the Shepherd, the Good Shepherd, and uh, then around Christ there are various scenes from the Old Testament, and uh, because uh, the early Christians were very eager to base all their beliefs on the deep tradition of the Old Testament, and in this case we see Jonah sort of as a classical nude because rules had not yet been set as to what was accepted, what was not accepted in art. Classical nude right here on a ship, then he is cast from the ship and spends three days in the whale, as you see here, then is spit out by the whale, and this was uh, interpreted as uh, presaging of um, the uh, of Christ's resurrection that after Christ's crucifixion on the third day he was resurrected just as Jonah was um, then spit out by by the whale the tradition of uh, the good shepherd was very common in classical art because well most societies were agricultural societies and um, pastoral societies and uh, sheep and lamb and uh, cattle would be lost and would have to be uh, found and brought back. And a number of uh, classical gods, uh, like Hermes for instance, were often 
seen as um, patrons of uh, pastoral existence and bringing back these um, these animals. Uh, so the good shepherd is uh, was. Uh, borrowed by the Christians as the shepherd who oversees uh, his flock. Uh, we also see scenes of the Last Supper right here. We see scenes as well from uh, the Colosseum uh, where Christians were on rare occasions uh, used as a bait for the wild beasts. The persecution of Christians was not in fact as continuous and as frequent as the uh, later Christian writers would have us believe because, uh, well, ultimately the Romans were very tolerant and uh, only in extreme cases such as, for instance, the burning of Rome where Nero had to uh, find uh, a scapegoat that uh, Christians were blamed, for instance, and persecuted. It was during Nero's reign, in fact, that uh, it is said that both St. Peter and St. Paul were executed. St. Peter by upside-down crucifixion and St. Paul as a Roman citizen by beheading. Um, from Italy, we now travel back to Syria, to a little town of Dura Europas. It was a small garrison, a Roman garrison and trading city on the river of Euphrates, right here, in the Eastern Roman Empire. And um, it changed hands between the Parthians and the Romans, but it was Roman from about the middle of the 2nd century to the middle of the 3rd century. And there was a community of multiple religions. It's right here, Dura Europas. And the reason we go there is because uh, the art had survived and it's fascinating as a result. Here is your typical Roman military compound that is organized on a rectilinear principle and there, uh, once you get your PowerPoint, you can look at it more carefully if you're interested, there are buildings dedicated to various gods. Gods of antiquity, gods, uh, Greek gods, Roman gods, Syrian gods. There's also a synagogue a Jewish synagogue and also a church right here. The synagogue is um, the house uh, L7, it's right here. Here's the synagogue and um, Christian building is M8. So they were sort of in the same block, but we do remember that it, this, at this point there is, uh, there is a very uncertain distinction between the two. And here is the church. Now, in the church, two most important places are, one is, uh, is a dining hall for the suppers that uh, were conducted in the name of the Last Supper, of course, and then also the baptistry. So here, this particular space is the baptistry, as you see here. This is the assembly hall, the courtyard, and then the steps going upstairs because the dining the dining rooms uh, uh, were often um, on the second floor, as one was in the case of uh, Jesus his and his disciples. Uh, but the baptistry is very, so the dining hall is not preserved, but the baptistry is, so is the assembly hall. This essentially was a private house, a private home that was uh, converted into, uh, into a makeshift church. So here is the baptistry, here are the steps upstairs, downstairs, and uh, uh, this is uh, what it looked like. We see the same image of the uh, uh, Good Shepherd right here. The arch is a Roman arch, or later will become a Byzantine arch, and, uh, and there are various uh, sacred figures uh, in uh, procession. Uh, here is again the same the same image. Here is the baptistry, the assembly hall where people would assemble. Uh, then uh, the arch is right here, and this would be the baptismal font. A few steps away was the synagogue. Again, a private home, but the synagogue right here 
was uh, extensively decorated, which was in fact uh, surprising because uh, because the Jews very much embraced the second commandment, uh, the commandment we talked about last time in the case with the Byzantine Empire, the second commandment, thou shall not carve graven images, uh, over which the iconoclastic controversy happened in the middle of the 8th century in Constantinople and will extend for a hundred years. So for the most part Jews did not create imagery. But here in this synagogue uh, it is full of imagery, full of very interesting imagery. We are not quite certain uh, what each image uh, depicts even though many are identified but the mere fact of their existence is fascinating and, who knows, perhaps owes its um, existence to the fact that the Christian uh, sect operated uh, a couple of doors down the street and uh, while the Christians very much also embraced the uh, Ten Commandments, uh, they will never be as strict vis-a-vis -vis the Second Commandment as were the Jews. Uh, this, for instance, is uh, the image, we don't know of whom, who is, there is a man reading a scroll. And much of this imagery, again, relies on, um, on classical imagery, even though done, of course, uh, by unskillful artists, as we saw was the case in, um, in the catacombs. Here uh, is a plan, and uh, these are... Here you can see what each image that had been identified possibly represents, right here. We go back to Rome now, and uh, as we might remember from last lecture, uh, in the very early 4th century now, Constantine the Great legalized Christianity. His mother was Christian, Saint Helena, and, Christ, uh, and Constantine won the battle at the Milvian Bridge. He defeated his co-emperor um, at the Milvian Bridge in the year 312 and consequently legalized Christianity because tradition has it that the, he uh, fought the battle under a Christian banner. Christ helped him become the sole emperor. Well, the moment the religion was legalized, it had to be organized. Uh, there were needed buildings, there were needed assemblies, and because with the Christian religion, a congregation met inside a religious building, not on the outside as uh, was the custom in pagan religions. These buildings had to be large to accommodate uh, the growing numbers of, uh, of Christians. Constantine, even before his own conversion, which supposedly happened on his deathbed, was uh, very well disposed to Christianity and in fact sent his mother on a mission to Palestine there to build the Christian uh, sanctuaries. Um, and in Rome itself, uh, a church was needed. And as I had mentioned before, the bones of St. Peter were identified even though 300 years almost passed, and were transferred to the Vatican Hill where Nero originally built his um, Hippodrome. But that Hippodrome was ultimately destroyed and uh, the Church of St. Peter's was built there. This was the original church. Again, as I had mentioned, uh, Christians did not have their own uh, examples of architecture and therefore they had to look back at Roman architecture. And one of the most prominent buildings in Rome was a basilica. Now, a Roman basilica was a civic building. It was not a religious building. But, um, but the Christians felt that it suited their purposes. And as such, they adopted the basilica. This is the basilica right here with the front court and it could indeed accommodate many people. In fact, so many there were by that time in Rome 
that the Christians felt it was necessary, in fact, to add a separate wing, so to speak, to the basilica, as you see here, later on, it will be called a transept. And on the, on the side, there would be a baptistry that traditionally was, uh, was round. Here is a plan. Uh, if you exclude the transept, then this is a typical plan of a Roman basilica with two aisles or maybe one aisle each on each side and a nave. A nave uh, takes its name from the Roman word for a ship and the Christian church was Christ's uh, ship. And then uh, with the Roman basilica for the most part entrances were on the sides and then two apses were on each longitudinal end uh, where sculptures of emperors or important uh, men of Rome uh, were placed, whereas here the Christians utilized the apse for, for their altar and then uh, uh, transferred the entrance to the west side, to one side. Now the windows that one sees here, they were already adopted by the Romans from the Egyptians. And uh, these windows right here are called clerestory windows. One sees them in ancient Egypt, as you see it here, where the central portion of the building was built up above the side aisles, and there was pierced, the wall was pierced with windows, so light would come into the central portion, in our case, into the nave, as is the case here. Uh, this is uh, a plan of the old Peter that has survived. In the very early 16th century, by that time the basilica was over a thousand years old and one was in, in disrepair. Also the problem was that the foundations were built on a marshy um, terrain and as such could not sustain the building, well it did sustain it for a thousand years, but by the early 16th century it was deemed unsafe. It was, alas, destroyed entirely and the new St. Peter's was built as we see it today. Alas, because the old St. Peter contained a great deal of spectacular art and mosaics, which of course are irretrievably lost today. This is what it ultimately came to look like here. Then there would be other buildings around it. The entire Vatican was built around here. Um, the baptistry, we're not certain which part. Here is St. Peter, there's the uh, our transept and uh, the courtyard that was adopted ultimately from a Roman forum. Uh, here it is again, as you had seen it, and uh, it was recreated very compellingly by the series of the Borgias, and uh, has Jeremy Iron playing Alexander VI, who was the Borgia Pope. It was after his reign that Julius II took down the old basilica and had the new one built, begun. But under uh, Alexander VI, uh, played here by Jeremy Irons, it was still the old basilica. And here is the interior that was recreated and that is very, very beautiful. And it was done on a longitudinal uh, plan, as you see it here. Today, something quite similar on a smaller scale can still be seen in Santa Maria Maggiore in Rome that was um, built uh, a little later after St. Peter's, but on the same basic plan, but only with one aisle on each side, as opposed to two aisles on each side. But here is the nave with the Roman columns, and everything inside is covered in beautiful mosaics, just as it was in St. Peter's. Fortunately, we have Santa Maria Maggiore, we did not have um, St. Peter's. We will return here later. Another early Christian building was, uh, uh, was the mausoleum of Santa Constanza, who was presumably the daughter of Emperor Constantine. 
It was built around uh, the reign of Constantine the First, even before St. Peter's, and it became her mausoleum. Uh, she died in the middle of the 4th century, and this is as often appropriate for mausoleums, is a round structure. Uh, here it is, here is the plan. It has uh, uh, Constance's uh, uh, sarcophagus was placed in the middle, and then around the middle there was the so-called ambulatory, right here, ambulatory. This is what you're looking at. This is where one walks around. Ambulare in Latin means to walk around. The double row of Corinthian columns, the Roman columns right here. And today it, is, it serves as, uh, as a church with the altar placed here where the original sarcophagus was placed. I think the sarcophagus in the cap is in the Capitol Museums. Uh, what is fascinating about it is it, there's this, this period of transference. It's still very much the Roman Empire. It's the late the Roman Empire. And here, uh, unlike the catacombs, we are dealing with the imperial workshops uh, of very, very high quality. And these workshops produce beautiful mosaics because by the late empire, the mosaics that usually were used on floors of Roman baths now have climbed walls and ceilings and as a result have survived. And here we see much still of antiquity and uh, the little putti right there who will later on become angels are depicted. This among vine scrolls uh, seems to be an image of Constanza herself and various preoccupations, whether pastoral or agricultural, are also depicted. And while not all the mosaics survived, some did. And the difference between uh, this period as opposed to the very early period in Constantinople is because Constantinople, remember, was started anew from scratch. This, this is Italy where Roman civilization had now existed for a thousand years and they will not very quickly switch to the uh, um, to revelationary art as was immediately done or rather speedily done in, uh, in the East. Uh, here they will still hang on to classical traditions and this is what we see in this mausoleum. Here is the same uh, portion, the little putti, uh, here they are playing, drinking wine, it almost looks sort of like a bacchanal, which of course belongs very much in the pagan tradition. The mosaics of Santa Constanza are uh, important examples of the early Christian art. At some point the early Christian art encompassed both the late empire art in Italy and Byzantine art and the early Byzantine art. Today, however, a distinction is made and uh, we will see that uh, while the Byzantine art rather speedily turned to revelation, uh, Italian art still held on to its classical traditions. And this also is an example, just, just beautiful greenery with birds uh, done with exquisite uh, workmanship. Again we go to the east this time, we go from east to west, east to west, and this is, uh, this is Constantine's mother who went to Palestine and determined which religious places uh, there were. And, uh, well, because, uh, let's face it, we are in the early 4th century, Christ died in the early 1st century. 300 years uh, had passed, and uh, at the time of his crucifixion, he was simply considered by the Romans as another criminal against the state, which is why he was crucified. And uh, even though, according to later tradition, he was uh, placed in the sarcophagus, etc. We really don't know what happened to the actual body. 
as opposed to the sanctified body. However, there was Saint Helena, who was Constantine's mother, who was there on a mission to, uh, to mend this situation. And uh, she walked around Jerusalem and she felt that that particular spot was the best, uh, that answered best, say, for the place of a sepulchre, and that particular mound answered best for, um, for the Mount of Calvary, uh, or traveled to Mount Sinai, in the Sinai Peninsula, uh, which of course is nothing but mountains, and uh, rather determined which uh, mount was the particular mount of Sinai, and the building was built there. Later on, if you remember from the first lecture, uh, Justinian built a monastery on the, of St. Catherine at the foot of uh, Mount Sinai. But it was really St. Helena who determined these places. We also shouldn't forget that all these places had uh, religious significance for the uh, earlier pagan religions and in fact superseded them. In fact, uh, the uh, Church of the Holy Sepulchre today, it used to be uh, the temple of, uh, um, of Venus under, under the Romans. Here it is, the, uh, the rotunda that you see here was uh, built over what St. Helena determined to be uh, the Holy Sepulchre, and then the basilica here was built over the Mount Calvary. Today, this entire structure is covered with one building. The entrance is still through this double door, and as you walk inside the building immediately to your right, one uh, goes up to what presumably was uh, the Mount Calvary, Golgotha, the Mount of the uh, Skull. And to one's left, one proceeds into the sepulchre. So, as I said, this is, uh, this is really a veritable labyrinth of, uh, of various spaces that uh, today are controlled by different Christian religions, whether, whether it's Armenian or Eastern Orthodox, Western Orthodox, etc. But the space was determined uh, by Saint uh, Helena and uh, it was nearly completed by the middle of the 4th century. And now I want to make a distinction between East and West. In the West, the popular, the most popular architectural structure was longitudinal, right here, as we saw with Saint Peter. And this is what it would look like, they would, they would have it. A basilica with a clerestory, with a little court in front called atrium, and then uh, a basic nave with uh, side aisles, uh, could be two side aisles, one side aisle, but it was a longitudinal uh, structure. And then later on the uh, transept would also be built there to accommodate more people. Whereas in the east, uh, there would be a central planned church. So, basilica planned church in the west and the central planned church in the east. And uh, from the last lecture, we saw this type in um, the Church of Hagia Sophia, for instance, and uh, we saw this type uh, in, uh, in the case of uh, San Vitale in Ravenna. Uh, In the same precinct where San Vitale is, in Ravenna, there stands another little church, a centralized plan, right here. And that was the mausoleum of um, Gala Placida built before San Vitale was built. This one uh, was built uh, about the middle of the 5th century. San Vitale, if you remember, was built uh, sometime uh, in the uh, middle of the 6th century. So this one is an earlier church and belongs to the Western early Christian tradition. Its decorations belong to that tradition. The plan is centralized, the Eastern plan. Now Gala Placida herself, as you see she lived in the early 5th century, was the daughter of a Roman Emperor Theodosius who ruled from Constantinople but then she was also regent to her son. By this time, however, Germanic tribes are pushing down at, uh, 
significantly. And uh, in fact, various treaties are organized between, uh, between the empire and the tribes. And Gala Placida, in fact, became wife to uh, a Gothic king by the name of Ataulf. Not for long, for a couple of years. And then she was um, married to still another emperor. But here in Ravenna, because Ravenna, remember, is the vice-regency of uh, the Eastern Court in the West, and here is her mausoleum. Uh, very unprepossessing to look at, uh, just a small brick building, even more unprepossessing than San Vitale, but just as San Vitale walking in is a whole different experience because uh, it actually survived quite well and it's just filled with the most spectacular Christian mosaics. Uh, and uh, the mosaics uh, include uh, vine scrolls here, which are still very classical, and the imagery, Christian imagery, which is still very classical in uh, in its uh, appearance and its execution, unlike, remember, unlike the um, Byzantine imagery. Because even here, when you look at it, you see the foreground, middle ground, background, there's a definite recession, there's definite perspective in these images. And the uh, clothes that these saints wear are still very much resemble Roman togas and described in uh, naturalistically in light and shade. Uh, Peter and Paul here, St. Lawrence there, St. Lawrence, in the case of St. Lawrence, he was a saint who, whose martyrdom was being burnt uh, alive and as a result uh, he usually is portrayed along with, uh, with fire and, uh, and his attribute is a gridlon. Here uh, you can see here these beautiful, beautiful, still classical decorations where three-dimensionality still very much persists with, um, with vaults decorated in what appears to be starry skies and, uh, and as I said, the uh, various saints portrayed in a rather classical fashion. Uh, here, here, more imagery just so you see how really spectacular this place is. Very remarkable. There's, there's our St. Lawrence. You see this, there's the Gridelon uh, with fire and uh, still books. Uh, the, these books uh, usually are the Old Testament, the New Testament. The definitive version of the New Testament was decided upon uh, in the year 325 during the Council of Nicaea presided upon by Constantine the Great, and that uh, became the, um, well, as I said, the definitive version. Uh, so the books here are shown, the starry sky, as you see, the geometric pattern is still very Greco-Roman and exhibits the great deal of uh, three-dimensionality. Uh, here are more uh, pictures of uh, this, this remarkable church. And above the entrance, again, we see Christ as Good Shepherd in the uh, space that's called a lunette, semicircular space. Uh, it is a very uh, famous mosaic, and uh, Christ is seen here in the middle, uh, surrounded by his flock, and he is still very much conveyed through classical means. His pose, his pose itself, is done in a serpentine fashion, which is a very sophisticated way of depiction and a difficult way of depiction. Uh, you remember that a hundred years later, we will see the mosaics of Theodora and Justinian that are very, very rigid. There's nothing rigid about this Christ. He is still very much alive, he still very much looks like a natural, a realistic human being as, as I said, as he turns. And uh, surrounded by the flock, uh, foreground, middle ground, background, as I said, not, he is looking in one direction and yet uh, pets uh, one of his sheep uh, into a different direction. Uh, 
his folds are done in um, light and shade, and the same is done with the background. It's a blue background uh, determining blue sky as opposed to a gold background that uh, will be the case in a nearby uh, church of um, San Vitale. And here you can see it's very difficult to convey exact colors on, uh, on slides. But the idea, as you see, of light and shade is here very much conveyed through the mosaics. The, uh, another example of, uh, of a lost sheep, and it's called the Cleophorus Shepherd, holding a ram, in this case, or a lamb. Uh, and as I said, it's uh, an iconic uh, image rooted in classical art and very often what the uh, Christian artists would do, uh, they would take these uh, iconic images from classical art and recarve heads uh, to convey the image of Christ as say, rather than the image of the uh, classical Hermes. Here is uh, a painting of, uh, again, a, a typical scene uh, in, in any pastoral society where uh, a shepherd br brings back uh, a lost sheep. And now we are back to Santa Maria Maggiore that we looked at as an example of what St. Peter may have looked like. And uh, in, in the case of Santa Maria Maggiore, it is covered with beautiful uh, mosaics right here with scenes from both the Old and the New Testament. Uh, right there in the apse is in the semi-dome uh, we see a later image of Christ crowning his mother, the Virgin Mary, as Queen of Heaven. Uh, but, but these, the ones on the side, are in fact very early mosaics, the mosaics that come to us from, uh, from the 5th, 6th centuries. And uh, this is uh, a particularly interesting one, and it's parting, the parting of Lot and Abraham when they, uh, when they came from Egypt and uh, the, the shepherds that belonged to both houses, even though they were related, uh, quarreled as to where they wished to go, in which case uh, Abraham went towards Canaan, whereas Lot went uh, towards the Dead Sea to ultimately to the land of uh, Sodom and, uh, and Gomorrah. So what you see here are the shepherds at the bottom at the lower register, and these are the shepherds that quarrel between each other. And then in the upper square, uh, there's Abraham. You know this is Abraham because he is, uh, he, his hand is placed on um, the head of uh, his son Isaac, who was not yet born. So he's, he's, uh, paint, he is uh, depicted as a very small child, and this is Lot whose two daughters right here are depicted next to him. There creeps in uh, the hierarchical uh, principles that we had seen in the Byzantine art, and that is of uh, whoever is more important is depicted larger. And even in the case of Lot with his daughters, we don't know what age they are, but uh, they look like two little women, and here is Lot. And the mosaicist is still attempting to convey the split by showing both going their different ways and a split in the middle. Um, we are entering the age of registers instead of uh, geometrical recession. And here, presumably closer to us, uh, is the register of the, of the shepherds. And here you see it again. There's still an attempt of portraying the folds in uh, lights and darks, uh, rather than just uh, uh, either black or gold lines, rather than just sheer striations. And uh, still another uh, early Christian image, which is very important, and that is the uh, sarcophagus of Junius Bassus. Now, Junius Bassus was a Roman prefect. Um, as I said, this is still technically the Roman Empire, the late Roman Empire. Uh, it will uh, administratively cease to exist towards the end of the 5th century, 
when the last Roman Emperor will be replaced with an Ostrogoth king. But uh, right now, the Roman Empire politically still exists, even though it is becoming more and more Christian and less and less uh, pantheistic. Um, the uh, Julius Bassus himself was an important figure. He was a senator, he was in charge of uh, the capital and uh, as prefectus, and then died, uh, well, for us, at a fairly early age of 42 in uh, 359. It is unclear when he became um, a Christian. The sarcophagus tells us that he became Christian on his deathbed, but he obviously was uh, very much inclined towards Christianity before that. It's very possible that, uh, um, that his family was uh, Christian already because this sarcophagus is carved with biblical imagery, uh, not with um, Roman or Greco-Roman imagery, as most of the sarcophagi were carved in the 2nd, 3rd century. The sarcophagi uh, appeared in uh, the Roman Empire, became very popular in about the 2nd century AD. We don't exactly know why, whether it had to do with advent of Christianity, uh, but uh, the fact is the sarcophagi were becoming more popular. Um, another reason might be because the Roman armies uh, that uh, spent so much time in the East were exposed to various Eastern mysteries, uh, including uh, Mithraism, that was the predominant religion of the Roman army, and uh, the religion of Sibeli also, and those mystical religions all preached resurrection, so the body was important. Whatever the reason, uh, in the second century the sarcophagi began to appear and uh, people began to be immune uh, as opposed to cremated. But by this time, uh, this sarcophagus you see, which was carved in the East, uh, depicts not uh, Roman scenes, not Greco-Roman scenes, not the scenes of fighting or the scenes of uh, mythology, but uh, biblical scenes. And here uh, there are both the scenes from the Old Testament and the scenes from the New Testament. And here we see a scene from the Old Testament and of Abraham, uh, who is called by uh, his God to sacrifice his son. We saw one of those images uh, last time in the last lecture in uh, San Vitale. And here he is uh, prepared to sacrifice his son, right there. There's St. Paul or St. Peter arrested. Jesus sitting on an orb surrounded by uh, Peter and Paul. Here is Jesus himself. This encompasses, in fact, uh, two quadrangles. This is Jesus being judged by Pontius Pilate, who is washing his hands. This is Jesus. Back to the Old Testament, here is the image of Job sitting on a dung hill, Adam and Eve. Jesus entering Jerusalem uh, astride a donkey that looks more like a lamb here. Uh, Saint, uh, this is Daniel uh, in the lion's den, and this is Saint Paul or Saint Peter. This is Saint Peter being arrested, this is Saint Paul being arrested. Uh, there's the following slide right here for you to look at if you're interested, well hopefully you're interested, um, which uh, describes each, um, each scene. Now, Although the figure appear rather awkward, nevertheless, they are very three-dimensional and uh, quite expressive. And as I said, even though the donkey here appears to look like lamb, and uh, Adam and Eve have heads far too large for them, nevertheless, nudity is still very much uh, the case, as was the case, in fact, in the uh, Greco-Roman art that uh, valued the beauty of the human body. Uh, as I may have mentioned last time in the first lecture, uh, there's no explicit prohibition in the Bible against nudity. However, the very case of Adam and Eve who were ashamed of their nudity in the garden, and then St. Paul who was uh, virulently uh, anti-sexual, who preached on many occasions against sexuality, and then of course nudity 
all of that may have been the case for Christianity rejecting nudity altogether later on. But it's still here now because we are kind of in a late empire. Uh, here are the descriptions of the, uh, of the scenes and uh, still uh, another uh, very interesting scene here that um, it is a small ivory panel and it dates to the early 5th century and it's one of the earliest portrayals of crucifixion. Uh, there was a problem with crucifixion because ecclesiastical debates were very common in um, Constantinople, for instance, and in the early empire. And the debates uh, about uh, Christ's nature, is it uh, human nature, is it divine nature, is it a dual nature, is it a monophysic nature? Uh, and uh, the, these debates became quite heated. Uh, and this reflects in art as well, because if Christ were of uh, a holy divine nature, then he could not have suffered, because uh, for obvious reasons divinities do not suffer. And if Christ were co-equal with God, then he could not have suffered. And uh, this image, as you see here, is him exhibiting himself uh, almost co-equal with the cross itself and certainly not suffering. There is absolutely no hint of a slumping body or any suffering in uh, his limbs or, uh, or his uh, face. Uh, that will come. The suffering Christ will appear later, but here in the 5th century he is uh, still very much Christ, the unsuffering God, as you see. But there is a different image of death within the same plaque and uh, it is right here. And this is the suicide of Judas. And when one kind of looks outside the box, uh, one thinks that we would, uh, one realizes that we would not have, we would not have Christianity had Christ not been betrayed by Judas. Somebody had to do it. And uh, another apocryphal story goes that uh, Judas was in fact uh, Christ's favorite disciple who loved his uh, master unquestionably and uh, and he was the only one whom uh, Christ uh, to whom Christ could appeal to do the unthinkable to betray him as a result of which uh, Christ will be crucified and will become God but Judas of course would be cursed in all eternity and according to this story, Judas could not live with it and uh, scattered his 30 silver pieces, disemboweled himself and hung himself. And uh, here is the image of Judas with the uh, 30 uh, silver pieces at his feet. So very two extremely diff different images of death. One of uh, what Christ will become, and that is supreme divinity. And Judas, of course, uh, who will uh, be cursed for eternity. Here it is. Here is, perhaps you can see it better. Uh, on one side is uh, Virgin Mary and uh, St. John the Evangelist. On the other side of Christ is uh, Longinus, the Roman soldier who inflicted the wound on Christ's side. Actually, he inflicted that wound on Christ's right. But here he is depicted on Christ's left. Well, no matter. Uh, essentially, two very different scenes of sacrifice. Well, here we are, back to the old map. And that is the map of uh, the Eastern Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, that we covered in our first introductory lecture. And this is the... Uh, Western Empire and with the Western Empire will stay essentially for the rest of the semester. But as you see, nothing just happened overnight. And in the West, where Roman tradition was so incredibly strong, this tradition still prevailed in the early Christian uh, times. And even when all will be destroyed and when humanity will in fact descend into subhuman level, and it will happen in a number of these areas. The mind will never forget about the greatness of the, um, of the Roman Empire. 
And uh, even though the Renaissance scholars of the 15th and the 16th century regarded from about the year 500 to the year 1500 as completely lost, that was not the case. Uh, yes, the years between 500 and 800 could indeed be called the Dark Ages, as the early medieval ages were called. But uh, beginning the year 800, things began to wake up, and particularly after the year 1000. And uh, by the 12th century, that time was called the High Middle Ages. And towards that time, we shall proceed. Thank you very much. I will see you soon.